Hi everyone, Brian here wishing you a wonderful Monday and a great week ahead. We're plunging into the New Testament to look for figures in the New Testament that have become part of the New Testament narrative that became intriguing to New Testament writers and who the community of first Christians wanted to hold up both to themselves but also to future generations of Christians like us. And of course, it's our perspective in this video series to recognize that they were people who had a cognitive capacity to be aware of the voice of their soul and uh, had that enhanced, nurtured, uh, and perhaps burst into a new awareness through their experience of Jesus Christ. But before we look at these figures, uh, we are taking some time to ask the question, who is Christ as a person who lived this union of uh, mindfulness about who he was as an individual, a thoughtful, insightful person, a Jew of the first century, somebody who lived under the uh, kind of oppressive thumb of the Roman Empire, uh, a Galilean uh, who was sort of seen as a rural uh, dummy by probably people in Jerusalem and even the surrounding countryside of Judea. Uh, the, that person who actually had a physical body and enjoyed turning water into wine and uh, going to dinner parties with uh, some of uh, the disciples uh, he met in various communities, uh, who knew he didn't have a home for his body and his, you know, he had slept out in the rough, uh, but who also was extraordinarily attuned to the voice of his soul. Not just extraordinarily, because uh, that's been true of many people over the centuries, but the commitment of his disciples and the insight of the church ever since is that he was perfectly attuned to the uh, voice of the soul within him. He was an utterly integrated uh, uh, reality, so much so that uh, simply calling him a human with great attributes uh, didn't make the measure, even for those uh, in the very first century who were not disciplined Christian theologians or Nicene Creed people or had great Western philosophical degrees from universities. Uh, even his very first disciples knew that the term Messiah wasn't big enough for him. Uh, he had burst through every kind of expectation uh, they could have had of what a human follower of Jesus, even a faithful Orthodox Jew, uh, most attuned to tradition and scripture could have possibly achieved. There was something about Jesus that utterly transformed him. Uh, the term we use actually is transfigured, which Peter and James and John uh, experienced on the mountaintop. And that was so potent in his life uh, that even the cruel death on the cross uh, could not bind him forever. Uh, he was free and released uh, from even uh, death. Uh, and we're all familiar with those terms, but again, as we've been saying both about the Hebrew scriptures and what we'll find, <coughs> excuse me, generally in the Christian scriptures, is that we tend to look at it theologically first. What does it mean to be Christ theologically? And we can, you know, we underscore what the Greek term meant and uh, what it meant in the first century and why the disciples used it and how they evangelists referred to it and what the authors of the New Testament probably meant by it. Uh, we can uh, talk about the theology that emerged uh, about the Holy Trinity and Jesus' role in it, the incarnation, salvation, history, all of that kind of thing is, is a big topic uh, for uh, Christian thinkers. It's also true that the Gospels can be seen as the record of the story of Jesus, that he really lived, he really uh, exercised um, uh, his ministry, he probably displayed some uh, extraordinary signs of power, uh, and he probably undoubtedly died at the hands of the Romans 
uh, on a Roman cross. Um, and we, can, we do get all sort of swept up into those two things, and they're huge topics and can command our thinking for a very long time. But, as we're constantly saying in this series, to ignore the reality of the intersection, the interaction, the interior dialogue that went on inside Jesus constantly at every moment of his life, intersecting his uh, life, his ministry, his reality, living it out among real people in a real circumstance, in real first century uh, Palestine and Judea. Uh, there was a constant uh, aware, awareness on the part of Jesus of the uh, activity, dynamism, and voice of the soul. So much so that Jesus himself claims that he and the Father are one. By this he means that not only was he attentive to soulfulness, which understands and recognizes import, significance, the zing and zest of life, the joy of life, it also is the place where grief has great meaning and gravitas. Uh, it's all of the things that bring us wonder and awe uh, in, in the course of our lifetime. But the soul expands beyond that and uh, touches, helps us to touch again cognitively the great mystical truths of the universe, the energies of the universe, uh, that extend beyond time and space and are in no way uh, determined by energy or matter. Uh, in other words, as religious people, uh, Christian people would put it, we're in touch with the rhythm of the divine or the Holy Spirit or the great spiritual truth of the universe. Uh, we have a sense of connection to the very beginning and a recognition that that very beginning is headed toward a very real uh, divine uh, uh, completion or conclusion. Uh, and uh, Jesus lived that uh, extraordinarily in every moment. He, he didn't just speak with human wisdom. Uh, and this was what was confusing to his first disciples, and let's face it, still confusing to his 21st century disciples. Uh, he comes from a place and he speaks from a place that unites heaven and earth. Uh, and he, he is uniting heaven and earth uh, in everything he says, everything he does, and in every way he gathers people together. He is speaking from his soul to their souls. And uh, you can see this quite often when uh, his relationships or his healings or his interactions with others seem sort of unbelievably uh, potent or intimate or uh, overwhelmingly significant in some way. Um, he speaks to demons and, and the demons react, etc., etc. Well, this is all first century metaphorical ways of, of showing us that Jesus was attuned to his soul, allowed his soul, and was comfortable with his soul interacting with his everyday uh, mind. And his everyday mind was, of course, uh, very much in touch with the everyday minds of everyone else. And you can see the difference between people who embraced his gospel, good news, and those who didn't. Uh, people who were able or interested or willing or um, even just for a moment uh, allowing their everyday demanding and controlling self to let go and open up to a great spiritual truth uh, that is always bubbling up within us. These people were able to interact with Jesus in um, extraordinary ways, sometimes very courageous on their part, uh, sometimes uh, rather extraordinary in their experience, especially if they are receiving a healing or uh, are the subjects of one of his great uh, miracles. Uh, and this is because it's soul-to-soul -soul talk that the soulfulness in Jesus was able to come out in actual words, actual deeds, uh, but also the vibrancy and charism of his behavior and get past the everyday mind that can be a, 
a guardian of anything that we don't want that's, you know, that might get in the way of the way we compose or control our lives and zoom right into the soulfulness of uh, the people he was around. This is why, you know, Peter and his brother Andrew, uh, James and John the Zebedee boys, uh, immediately respond to Jesus. Um, who knows if, in fact, uh, they did just drop their nets, didn't say goodbye to anybody, and walked off with Jesus. That's probably highly suspect. But the soulful truth of Jesus being present to them and uh, the soulful nature of Jesus being so comfortable within the nature of Jesus as fully God and fully human uh, offered itself and immediately it was responded to uh, by at least these four guys, uh, Peter uh, and Andrew and James and John. And, uh, and you hear that again in many, many cases. The demons were immediately ejected. The child was immediately healed. Uh, these, are, uh, these are stories that aren't, you know, sort of miracle healing stories simply in the physical realm. Uh, uh, that's the way we read Bible if we're not going to read the Bible as a place that tells us stories about the soul. If we're open to the truth of the soul, then all of a sudden, knowing how the soul works, because we all have one, it's part of our everyday lives, we, we can get a little taste of it, uh, then we can see that it's not something so uh, uh, absolutely obscure or beyond comprehension or unnatural or even supernatural. Uh, what Jesus is doing is... Uh, supernatural in as much as it is ultra natural. Uh, this is, it's, it's, um, it's the way, the nature of us. Jesus was the most naturally living uh, human being uh, that we know, at least as Christians, uh, that he lived uh, a full life where his physicality and his personhood uh, was constantly in dialogue, united, integrated with his soulfulness. Uh, and that's what made him who he was and why so many people around him were so extraordinarily responsive to him. Uh, again, I do want to stress that, that Jesus isn't going around magically with a magic wand making soulfulness in people. He was awaking soulfulness in people which is why he's always encouraging his disciples to stay awake. Uh, not uh, as precisely because what he's encouraging them in the first century and us in the 21st century to do is to be awake to the fullness of who we are. The problem we have in the 20th first century is not so distant from the issues they had in the first century. Uh, we have uh, more of a secular uh, hump to get over than they had. At least people in the first century believed that there was a spiritual truth uh, at work in the world and perhaps even emphasized it. There were temples on every corner in the Roman world. Uh, there was a belief in gods and goddesses and that you could, through spiritual prayer and um, ritual activity, uh, be in touch with these uh, mystical realities outside of ourselves. So at least it was a culture and society that was deeply soaked uh, in the uh, reality of spiritual truth. Um, however, it, uh, it was just as much a world that was confused about listening to the authentic soul, uh, listening to the true voice of God, uh, and uh, furthermore, uh, embracing it and building your life around it. Uh, we've talked about this before, that you know, the first uh, words of the, uh, of the uh, divine truth to any human being is almost always comfort uh, and, and an assurance that all will be well. But the second, um, and often the longest period of spiritual development we have, is when that divine truth that said all will be well 
uh, and you will be fine and the world that you're in will be fine. Uh, nevertheless, we have to come into contact with the real divine voice, the real divine truth that's behind that, which just blows apart uh, our Sunday school view of God or our uh, culturally accepted views of what God might be like or how we use God in ordinary language. And uh, as we grow spiritually, it just blows that apart. And then third, it's how we take this deeper, uh, more insightful uh, revelation of how God is, and, and yet God is comforting and loving out to the world. Um, it, that second part has always uh, been difficult for people, and, and you can see it in Jesus' life. As he, as he introduces God to his disciples, they just, they just can't hold on to it. In one moment, uh, Peter is able to say to Jesus, you are Messiah. And in the next moment, he said, but Messiah couldn't possibly be that way. And what Jesus is trying to get across to Peter in that moment is what the voice of the divine was trying to get across to Abraham uh, centuries before. You must understand that it is the work of the divine in relation to human beings to offer sacrifice for the sake of the creation that divinity loves. Uh, and you must understand that, Peter, and uh, we must understand that ourselves. So we have this extraordinary figure at the center of the New Testament story. Uh, and you can see it in what I consider the second great story of the New Testament, which is that the Jewish followers of Jesus, after his ascension and the uh, leaving of the Holy Spirit, actually start to form a real community of people that um, vibrate with the uh, actual experience, the authentic reality that they had with Jesus. And, and this is thoroughly uh, mind-blowing, life-changing, transformative, not only for the disciples who knew Jesus, but a growing community of Jews who accepted uh, this extraordinary and amazing messiahhood that was all of a sudden presented to them. The second story was that the, as we said, the messiahhood, the Jewish messiahhood of Jesus was just too contained for the authentic truth of one who lived in that perfect alignment of life in the world and life of the divine rhythm that Jesus lived utterly aware of the voice of the soul within him, utterly aware of how that voice of the soul within him connected him to divine truth, and utterly aware that the capacity of that truth to be conveyed and shared with others was in fact the final gift of uh, the divine relationship. All of that being true in Jesus got lived out into the Jewish community. But we can see their shock when it also got lived out in the Gentile community, beginning with some faithful Gentiles who were very attached to Jewish synagogues all throughout the Roman Empire, and who began to radiate and vibrate and echo the experience of their Jewish Christian uh, friends and brothers and sisters. Uh, and this was mind-blowing for that first church. Uh, because all of a sudden, uh, right within the first few decades of the church, the very understanding of messiahhood had to expand. So it's my view that we have these two realities of Jesus. The, the incarnate Jesus Christ lived this life of perfect union between his earthly, physical, and social, intellectual feeling self and his uh, deep self connected to the soulfulness which connected him to the divine. He lived that life in complete union. That's the first great story. The second great story is that as a community, the understanding of that union, that integration of what it means to be united between heaven and earth, actually within each of us, uh, as individuals and in the community of the faithful who gather around these ideas, who gather around these realities, who gather around this transformative hope 
uh, for uh, themselves and for the world they share with others, uh, that there is this uh, constant growth and expansion. Uh, and uh, that sometimes uh, we're in the, on the side of that. We see it as St. Paul did. Uh, sometimes we're ambivalent like uh, St. Peter was. One day he was for it, the next day he was confused and frightened by it or was resistant to it as uh, we think James of Jerusalem was. Uh, we're we're going to be in all those three places, but we at least need to be aware that it's happening and that it's gospel truth. The Jesus who was incarnate has left us an expanding Christness uh, that will uh, lead us to all sorts of uh, magnificent discoveries, both in our own time, uh, as well as the legacy we'll leave for others. So uh, we want to stay uh, true to understanding the nature of Christ as the New Testament presents it, uh, to understand uh, some of the mystics and people who gathered around him. Till next time, next Monday, have a great week and thank you so much for listening.